Welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater figures of our time. For the first of a two-part chat, our guest today is the legendary general manager and producer of Broadway and Off-Broadway and Off-Off-Broadway, my old friend and colleague and country neighbor, Albert Poland. Welcome to Conversations, Albert. Very happy to be here, Bill. Uh, we could also add actor and singer, singer and founding member of the Judy Garland fan club to your list of, of accomplishments. Uh, what, but what does a general manager do? Well, uh, I should really say this is Carol Channing to make it interesting. Um, <laughs> he prepares the budget. <laughs> uh, what I, I'm really responsible for all the financial aspects of a production. Um, the first thing I do is negotiate the agreement between the producer and the author. Um, you know, the producer picks the show that they want to do and they come to me and if I like the show, which is really important to me, because that's where I get my energy, it's my passion for the project, uh, then I make the deal with the uh, author. Then we begin preparing the budgets for the production, the operating, and we make, I make all the deals and do all the contracts for the designers, the director, the actors, the theater. Uh, and I help plan the advertising campaign and the press campaign. And when the show is running, I'm responsible for the business operation of the show. Um, and it's much more um, exciting and passionate than it might, than it might sound. It's, it's not uh, you know, just cut and dried like somebody with an adding machine. Um, otherwise, because I, I couldn't do that. You know? uh, not many people are aware of the, uh, uh, of, of the business end or the passionate business end of, of uh, of a Broadway show or any kind of theatrical event, and uh, uh, we're going to be talking about that further. Can you? Uh, I, I would like to inform our audience, uh, our, our audience at home, uh, that uh, although I've known you for many years, I was just utterly shocked when you sent me your resume. I wanted to see in black and white what you've done, and. Uh, Albert sent me a 16-page resume, and uh, and I'm just skimming through this. Uh, the shows that Albert is involved, uh, Albert Poland has been involved with, are, are history of American theater for the last uh, how many years? 30 years. Uh, uh, I'm going back and starting in the present to uh, most recently Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, the uh, legend now legendary revival. The Boy from Oz, starring uh, Hugh Jackman. The legendary Long Day's Journey into Night uh, uh, revival. One More Time. Uh, the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged. Uh, Dirty Blonde. Uh, Marlene. Wait Until Dark. The Last Nights of Ballyhoo. Uh, Present Laughter. Mrs. Klein. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, it just goes on and on here. The Grapes of Wrath, one of my favorites. Uh, Steel Magnolias, Little Shop of Horrors, Orphans, A Lie of the Mind. Um, as is. As is. Not, not last but not least, not even last. Uh, so um, your involvement has been with every import, practically every important theatrical event. Uh, uh, which among these... Uh, no, I'll ask you first, where were you born? <laughs> Syracuse, New York, just like the Schuberts. You were born in Syracuse, New York. Yes, but we moved when I was two. We moved to the Midwest. We moved to a small town called Normal, Illinois, uh, until we were asked to leave. Um, <laughs> then we went to Indianapolis. Um, then Big Rapids, Michigan. I'm a product of the Midwest, I would say. And then I came to New York when I was 19 because I had to. Why'd you have to? Oh. Well, I grew up in the um, very repressed Republican 50s in the Midwest, um, and I always wanted to get out. You know, in my escape hatch, I lived in the movie magazines, you know. And, and the way I came to form the Judy Garland fan club was I was reading about Judy in the movie magazines coming out in A Star is Born. Her life seemed really dramatic to me. I loved her androgynous look. Uh, I went to see the movie. And I felt she was the most talented person I had ever laid eyes on, and that she needed my help. <laughs> so, so I looked for a fan. I looked for a fan club for her, and there wasn't one. 
So I started one. There know? was no Judy Garland fan club? No, the, the, her managers had never felt that she needed one, you know, I but see. at that point she was very pleased to have one. And, uh, and I, you know, in order to get your address in the movie magazines, you had to have a letter from the star. That was impossible to get. So one Saturday when my parents weren't home, I called her on the phone. <laughs> and in 1955, uh, a long distance call was a national event. You know, if there was one a year in a family. It was kind of amazing, you know. <laughs> um, and we, you know, the operator was as excited as I was. And we looked all over Hollywood for her number. And we finally got it at Warner Brothers. And, um, and she was thrilled, you know. And, you spoke uh, to her? Oh, yeah. I had a, I had a script that I'd written out. But she was so warm that I left the script immediately. You know, I said, oh, Judy, I love you so much. You know? And I told her that you know, I wanted to be in show business, and she was my inspiration. And she sent the letter a couple of weeks later. And um, within about four months, we had 5,000 members from all over the world. Um, and I was you know, uh, all of 14 years old at that time. Uh, How could you not be a general manager with that uh, background in show business? Well, it was a, it was a, a first entrepreneurial effort, I would say. You know, and a smashing success, yes. and it gave you great confidence. And also my first codependent relationship. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Why not start big? <laughs> uh, when did we first meet? Oh, you know? I think, yes. <laughs> I was nude the first time you met me. I'm disappointed that you don't remember. Um, <laughs> but I guess it wasn't memorable. Uh, I, was, I was doing a book called The Off-Off Broadway Book, published by Bob's Merrill, uh, with my that friend Bruce That book is Bruce used Nailman. as a textbook by one of uh, Susan Watson Turner. Professor Turner uses it oh, here. Oh, well, I'm honored. Anyway, it was a, a book about the history of Off-Off Broadway, and we had what we thought uh, were the seminal plays. Uh, of Off Off Broadway, and one of them was Bill's play. And uh, so I called him and I said, I need a copy of your script. And he happened to bring it over to my apartment on a very hot summer day. Uh, there was no air conditioning in my apartment. I think I was paying $30 a month rent or something. Uh, and I was sitting naked at the typewriter at the Naturally. desk. Naturally. And, and I just thought, you know, Screw it! I'm not going to dress up for him, and it'll be fun. It'll we'll see what happens, you know. And, uh, so he came in, and we met. <laughs> <laughs> Later, you uh, uh, Later, I wore clothes. That's yes. right. <laughs> Later, wearing clothes, you became general manager of As Is. I uh, did. Uh, uh, what was that like? Well, it was, you know, it was a very meaningful experience in every possible way. Um, you know, it was, it just, you know, I have um, four life-changing events in my life, and one of them was AIDS, you know, the advent of AIDS. Um, I stopped writing down friends' names when I reached 100. Um, and so the play was an incredible, meaningful play. It was powerful. Um, I, I think it was a masterpiece. I think it is a masterpiece. And... Uh, you know, I had a very, I have a very uh, excellent relationship with the Schubert organization, and I immediately wanted them to become involved as producers. And I took it to Bernard Jacobs, who was the president of Schubert at that time. He came down to see it at Circle in the Square and Circle Rep. Circle Rep. I'm yep. sorry, uh, and you know, w loved it. Uh, and also, you know, his very, very uh, close friends and, and peer, Michael Bennett, was in the process of losing his, his health to the disease. And so that was part of Bernie wanting to become involved. You know, he wanted to become involved. Right. Um, and, you know, the producers were John Glines and Larry Lane, who were authentic, really authentic, you know, off-Broadway, roll up your sleeves, get your hands down in the dirt producers, which are the kind I love. Um, and so it was my first time working with them. I remember when John came into my office, he looked at me and he said, at last, Albert Poland. You know? <laughs> and I was very pleased with that. And uh, the, it was a rich experience. And you uh, worked with Lucille Lortel, too. Yes, Lucille was on board. The legendary Lucille Lortel. Indeed, yes. Uh, what, uh, uh, aside from my play, uh, what were some of the... Uh, high points of your, what, what do you consider some of the, the best things you worked on, the things that most uh, stand out in your mind? Well, 
I really, I've, I've had the luxury of being able to pick and choose the things that I have done. Maybe only two or three times did there have to be food on the table. So I just bit the bullet and went with something I didn't really want to do. And I can tell you that doing that is, it's not worth it because people invest their hearts and minds in these projects. And if you know they're not going to succeed, or, you know, on any level, I mean, the, things don't have to be a wild financial success to be a success, if you understand. Right. You know, if they reach some kind of an audience, that's meaningful. Um, but so I've loved virtually everything I've done, but the things that come to mind as memorable, I, I would think that the artistic high point for me was the Grapes of Wrath. Um, it, it turned out to, you know, win the Tony Award um, that year. Frank Galati directed it and did the adaptation, and, and um, you know, it was just very meaningful. And it was the Steppenwolf Ensemble. There was a cast of 38. You know, it was, as is, by the way, it was my first Broadway show, and The Grapes of Wrath was my second Broadway show. Oh, my God. So it was, I just felt, wow, I'm, I'm having such an auspicious, you know, Broadway career of things that are meaningful, you know, to me. Um, Little Shop of Horrors was an amazing experience because uh, it was at the WPA and the head of the WPA called me and he said, uh, I want to talk to you about being the general manager of this. I went to see it and uh, forget about him talking to me about being the general manager. I just started being the general manager. And I went home and called Cameron McIntosh at four in the morning I said, because I had done two shows with Cameron off Broadway. I said, you know, you have to do this, and I want to call Bernie, because the Schubert organization had told me 12 years earlier, if you ever find a God spell, we would be interested. I, I had no idea they wanted off-Broadway, you know. So I waited 12 years, For that and call. I called them, and I called Bernie. He came to see it. He, he called David Geffen, who they were doing Dream Girls with. So um, I was responsible for bringing, you know, David Geffen and the Schubert organization uh, off Broadway for the first time, um, which was thrilling. You know, it was very exciting, and it was a huge responsibility. Uh, and the show ran five and a half years. You know, it was, it was one of the probably... And became a very famous movie. And yes, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and Howard Ashman, may he rest in peace, was a great talent, you know, and he and I are both, tor were both, well, I'm still a Taurus, he's no longer with us. Um, he's a former Taurus. Yes, he is. Uh, a Taurus in heaven. Yes, and, and you know, so Tauruses are great, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so we work very well together. Are you Tauruses out there? <laughs> uh, you talk about uh, uh, bringing these people together. Um, it is part of your responsibility as a, a general manager to do this, or, uh, or is this uh, something you wanted to do outside of um, that job, or is this part of the part of the package of creating the greater uh, package for the show? Quite honestly, I don't think it's part of the profile of what a general manager does, but it's part Sounds of unusual it's part me. of what I do mm -hmm. naturally. You know. I love to bring together elements that I think will make a show resonate right? because we are penetrating the toughest market in the world, you know. So the more people you can get in there that will just resonate what this show has to offer, you know, the better you are. And I also love to, I love talent more than anything. I don't have a great love for the theater. I have a great love for talent. Um, so I love to bring the very talented together and watch them, you know, interact and, and know that I help to do that. That's, that's like a great uh, blessing for me, you know, to be able to do that. Now, it seems to me that uh, a person like you at the mo this moment in theater is more valuable even than the, uh, than the writers and the, uh, than the actors and, uh, uh, than the directors because, uh, Theater is in a in a position in America that it needs this kind of energy uh, uh, to create more theater. Mm. Um, do you agree with that? No, no, <laughs> no. I could never think that I'm more valuable than a director or a writer or, or an actor. These are these are creative people. Mm -hmm. They are the blessing. I am the facilitator. You know. So um, that's the. I mean, way we are interdependent. Mm -hmm. You know, but. But I, I revere artists. You know. in, in my opinion, what uh, what you just did uh, explained what you did. That combin putting together of people is partly an artistic endeavor. 
Uh, that's just my could humble be. opinion. Mine, it could be. And uh, um, because uh, that's a sine qua non of reaching people. I can sit home and type uh, from now to doomsday, but mm -hmm. unless I have people like you on my side, I go nowhere. Right, right. And uh, uh, I, I just uh, salute that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think that's really, really important. How do you get these ideas? Do you just sit there and it comes to you? You mean ideas of who to combine? Yes. It comes to me almost immediately because I'm really familiar with the workforce, you know, the creative mm -hmm. workforce. And, and so somebody says, it's this. And I just think of half a dozen people that would be, you know, right. Right. We it. were having lunch, you and I, and suddenly you came up with this wonderful notion. And I, I said, does he, is he, this is, oh, so this is the way the man thinks. This is what comes to his, his mind. Uh, uh, what other shows uh, particularly stand out in your mind? Well, uh, Long Day's Journey and Tonight, I thought, was a masterpiece of a production. Uh, and, you know, it's, it was the most gratifying kind of achievement because it was a masterpiece that was a huge commercial success, you know. We ran for 20 weeks and we made $2.7 million. I mean, that is unheard of. To what, do you attribute, to what do you attribute the, uh, uh, this kind of runaway success? I it's think, hardly a cheerful subject. Right. I think, quite honestly, that the catalyst was Vanessa Redgrave. Right. Um, we had a brilliant cast, but if you had had someone other than Vanessa in that role, I don't think this would have happened. I just think it was the right moment for Vanessa Redgrave with this superb cast uh, it was a triumph of production. Uh, we didn't have one empty seat during the entire run. We were selling, you know, this new thing called premium tickets for two hundred dollars, which I, you know, I'm very conflicted about that. But on the other hand, how many masterpieces do we have that fail because the audience didn't come? Um, right. But you know, we were getting calls from people all over the world. I would like to come in from Cairo if I can get a ticket huh. to this show. You know. And, and I don't know if they were really from Cairo because I don't have caller ID, but Cairo, it Illinois. Me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paris, it was very big in Paris, Michigan, also. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so that was just that was quite gratifying. And, and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross was a similar experience. You know, I thought uh, I thought that was a perfect production or near perfect. I guess you can't really ever say something's perfect. And everyone got on. You know, it was. It just ran smoothly, and I find that most of the time, you know. Um, I have to say one of my biggest thrills uh, ever was working with Hugh Jackman in uh, The Boy From Oz. Um, I think he's right up there with Judy as a generous audience performer and a genius performer. I saw the show 35 times. I never saw him give one down performance. I told his mother I thought she had created one of the exemplary human beings I have encountered in my <laughs> life. He, he just could not be kinder and more thoughtful. Um, and I, like Judy. Well, Judy was, <laughs> Judy was very kind and thoughtful in her way. She really was. Um, she was very kind to the fan club members. And, you know, and every time I saw Hugh, I had to go back and tell him. Because, you know, you feel a kind of gratitude that you must express, you right. know, because you don't often feel it. Um, so that was, you know, that was a very, very high point for me. And I love the show aside from you. And, and I don't usually go after shows, but I went after this because Judy was one of the characters. And, and it was the show business that I wanted to come into. Right. You know, it was the romance of show business, you know, the backstage drama and really living the glamour. You know, um, I mean, that's what I was first drawn to. You know. uh, there seems to be precious little of that these days. Uh, some, but uh, well, it's digital. You know. It's a little digital. Yeah. Yes, and, and marketing. It's about marketing. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, do you think it's possible to have that kind of show business again? I don't think. I think it's possible to have it sporadically, like we did in The Boy from Oz. Uh, right. But I don't think it it will ever come back as a genre because. Because I think that we are too uh, wedded to technology, you know, and that show business was about flesh and blood and passion, and and I find that we're we're in an era of very, to me, bloodless technology, you know. Right. 
uh, and I think that's permeated our lives. I mean, there's going to be a time when we'll have a chip in our hand, you know. Uh, that's how far the merger will go in my mind. Um, and I don't think that kind of passion is wanted, you know. I, and I also think the world is such that people would prefer not to feel. Um, you know, and that's just my own view. Um, right. And so I think that's part of the attraction to technology. They don't have to feel. You know. uh, we have often talked about uh, uh, a Lottie Lenya as that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of performer, the, the, the passionate performer. Uh, and uh, uh, I know her best as my poker partner. Uh, <laughs> As I've told you, we, we used to play poker together, okay. and uh, Lenya was, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a fan. I never would have founded the Judy Garland fan club. Uh, I, I just am not, I don't have it in me, except for a few people, and Lenya was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I finally got it up my nerve to ask Lenya uh, what uh, was her favorite role. And she said, uh, Rosa Klebb from Russia with Love. <laughs> Much to my shock. Yes. The James Bond movie. Yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and she looked at me realizing I was shocked, genuinely shocked. She said, what do you think? Uh, a work of Bertolt Brecht, the poet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, what appealed to you about, I know you, you, you adored this woman and you listened to her, her her records. What do you? Her Who, Judy or Lenya? Lenya. What oh. do you? What? Um, I know you you sang in a choir with. Uh, well, not a choir. I sang, I sang in a concert with her. I sang. It was a duet, actually. Um, what? Uh, what do you Hall. see in, in a performer like that? I th I see authenticity. I s I see someone who can totally project every molecule of what she is, you know, and that's enormously powerful powerful to me. Mm -hmm. I think Louis Armstrong had that quality. I think P.F. had that quality. Hugh Jackman? Mm, no, I wouldn't say that about no. Hugh. Um, it's a different thing. I wouldn't say it about Judy. Um, right. It, it, the very sound of their voice, the very face they have, right. is, it's all of a piece, you know. Uh, and Lenya was just, to me, an authentic artist, you know. Um, and, 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 you know, we rehearsed for a week when I was with her at Carnegie Hall, and um, I couldn't take my eyes off of her, you know. And, and she called me into her dressing room afterward, and she made a gift to me of, um, of the German concert recording of Three Penny Opera, uh, which she inscribed to me, um, you know, which is just a treasure, because, you know, she's, she's just another artist that I really revere. Um, and, and, and I had a little experience with her prior to that, no, after that, I'm sorry, uh, in 1967, I had produced uh, a touring company of the Fantastics, and I wanted to do a touring company of Three Penny Opera, which is mm -hmm. my favorite musical, the uh, Mark Blitzstein adaptation. It's perfect, perfect. Uh, and I had, I thought, of this brilliant idea of having Judy Garland play Jenny on, <laughs> on, the, on the road, okay? And that is a great idea. And that she would, and I would give her the Mac the Knife song, and give her You Can't Let a Man Walk Over You. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be that much time on stage, and she was at a low point in her career. Um, and Lenya gave me a 90-day free option, because she loved Judy, which I knew, uh, for me to go and find Judy. And I kept, I kept reaching last week's lawyer, you know, who said, if you find her, I, she has a bill with me. <laughs> um, and, and I finally in, inadvertently ran into her in Jilly's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having been her fan club president, I got up and went over and I sat down with her. And, um, and I didn't even tell her what was in my mind because I could see that it was not going to be possible, which was kind of sad. And the next day I dropped the option, you know. That is a remarkable story. Mm -hmm. uh, what other shows uh, turned you on? Like, uh, uh, there, there were seminal shows for you. One more time. Um, I did the original production of The Village Gate, which uh, it was a New Orleans musical, and we had an authentic New Orleans cast and authentic jazz musicians who had played with Basie and, and you know, who'd really, you know, come up through the ranks. And 
One of them told me that I reminded him of a gangster he knew in Detroit, which I always loved. <laughs> um, you know, and, and Vernel Bonaris, you know, wrote it and directed it and starred in it with, with this just splendid cast. And it was three and a half years of party. You know, we did it all over the world. We did it in Germany. We did it in Paris. Uh, there were two touring companies in the United States. We had a s huge success in London. Um, and that was the most joyful experience I've had. And, and um, you know, and it was a very integrated company of black and white people loving each other, you know, and caring for each other. Um, so that meant a lot to me, too. And Jerry Wexler was involved as one of the producers, and he was a very seminal figure in Atlantic Records. And right. He brought Ray Charles into a studio, and Aretha Franklin, and he worked with the music on it. Pepsi Bethel was the choreographer. You know, he kind of invented the Lindy. You know, it was these, again, authentic artists, you know. Albert, I'm getting the high sign uh, to wrap up this uh, first part. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to connect with you today, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you about the rest of your luminescent career. Thank you, Albert Poland, and our studio and home audiences for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon for further conversations. Thank you, Albert. You're good.